Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode seven of Why Walks of Life. Let's inspire. I am your host, Peter Sobe. It's such a pleasure to be here on Fireside. Such a pleasure to have some friendly faces in the audience. Frederick, Graciela, Diana. So happy to see you here. So, All Walks of Life, Let's Inspire is a show where I'm going to tap into people from all walks of life, especially my life. Today's guest on All Walks of Life is the artist liaison for MFP North America. That's the mouth and feet painting artist of North America, Kate Adams. I'm actually a member of the MFP A because I am a mouth painter. I paint holding the paintbrush in my teeth. And we're going to get to know Kate on a more personal level today as well. And perhaps I'll even share my story of what prompted me to even apply to be in the MFPA. We also have the uh, Now You Know segment, Wheels of Wondering, and Whistles of Wisdom segments. So many segments, so little time. That's all coming up here on All Walks of Life today. So for those of you that don't know me, like I said, my name is Peter Sobe. And when I was 19 years old, I dove into a lake that was too shallow and I broke my spinal cord becoming a quadriplegic. But now it's 34 years later and I've lived my life by the mottos of you can't only survive, but you must thrive. And I feel like I've lived these 34 years of my life thriving. And the second motto I always live my life by is always look forward. Back in the early days when I was first injured, I had a deep conversation with myself one night. And I said, Peter, you have to promise yourself you're not going to look back and be depressed. You're not going to look back and be angry. You're not going to look back and keep asking, what if? You're always going to look forward. You want to know where you're going to be in six months from now, where you're going to be a year from now, where am I going to be five years from now? Always look forward. And that's led me to here. I kind of feel like this show is an amalgamation of my life. And some of my guests are people that I know intimately well. Some of my guests will be people that I'm just getting to know but I feel that they all have an inspirational story to share. And I hope that uh, you will be inspired by some of my stories and some of their stories. Before we get to our guest, Kate Adams, I do wanna share with you a little bit of a story of something that uh, happened to me this week. It's a good thing. So Thursday night, I was at the Wheel Turn here in Los Angeles, a concert venue, seeing the awesome band Metric. It was my third time seeing Metric live. I had the great fortune of actually getting to meet the band before the show. And let me tell you, they were just as nice as can be. And basically, I wanted to talk to them about the fact that Back when I had my accident that I just mentioned all those years ago, I dove into a shallow lake and I was instantly paralyzed and I was underwater probably about three minutes before my friend Ted saw me and pulled me out. And 33 years later, I had the chance to scuba dive for the first time in an Olympic pool. And as I got underwater and I was breathing, all I could think about was the metric song, Breathing Underwater, the whole time I was underwater breathing. And it was a very, very lethargic thing to just be breathing underwater, thinking about that song. And I shared that with them and they just loved hearing that story. But another thing that was just so awesome, Josh, the bass player, when he came up to talk to me, he actually kneeled down and got right in front of me and i can't tell you like what that means to me because 
lot of times I'm at parties or events or something and you're trying to talk to people and it's loud and you're trying to look up, it's really hard for me to sustain a conversation while looking up like this the whole time while trying to hear. And when people come down to my level, I know it hurts your knees or whatever, but I can't tell you what it means. And anyway, we had a great conversation. And when the conversation was done, I told him, uh, hey, Josh, thanks so much for coming down to my level. And he, he put his hand on his heart and he said, no, Peter, thanks for coming up to my level. Like you really touched my heart by sharing your stories and what our music meant to you. I just thought that was such a cool and inspirational story. And it's a line I think I'll use for a movie at some point in time, you know, like, Hey, thanks for coming down to my level. Hey, kid, thanks for coming up to my level. That's like the new Coke commercial. So anyway, lots of inspiration to be had. Wow, that's a lot of inspiration. Ah, yes. And if you're wondering who that voice was, that is none other than the co-host of my show, the AI Intelligent Robot, brought to us by the good folks over at MHS Software. It's MHS Ultra Seismic Megatroid 3033. Say hello, MHS Ultra Seismic Megatroid 3033. Well, hello, Peter. Yes, hello. Hello, Fireside audience. Mm-hmm. Hello, podcast Listeners. Oh, okay. And hello, world. Wow. That is a pretty domineering of you there, MHS Ultra Seismic Megatroid 3033. And okay, I think the time has finally come. I am so looking forward to have you all meet today's guest on the show. As I said, she is the artist liaison for MFPA North America, as well as a yoga teacher and a brand new mother. Please welcome Kate Adams. Hi, how are you? Hi, Kate. So good to see you. It's so good to see you again, Chita. Thank you. And uh, actually, MHS Ultra Seismic... Megatroid 3033 would like to say hello to you, Kate. Well, hello, Kate Adams. Even though an AI intelligent robot, I've got you in my system as Kate March. Huh. Ah, uh, yes. Think, <laughs> that was my maiden name. <laughs> yeah, so I actually recently got remarried and changed my name. So it is now Kate Adams. It was Kate March. So um, you are forgiven for the for the missing Kate memory. Kate Adams. Kate Adams. Going to take some getting used to. But I can't wait for you to teach me yoga. Yoga. Yeah, I must. Yeah, I, I must admit I've never I've never taught yoga to an AI program, but there's a first time for everything, so we shall see. Yeah, jeez Louise, MHS Ultra Seismic Megatroid thirty thirty three. How in the wide world of stretching are you going to do yoga? You're just an AI robot. I do all, and I see all. Well, I have to be honest, um, you already have the Ujjayi Pranayam, that, um, that Darth Vader breath that you're using is actually the key breath that we use in yoga practice. So you're already, I guess, you know, ahead of the game on that. So, you know, I'll be happy to have you in my class next time. Wow. See that MHS Ultra Seismic Megatroid 3033? Kate would be happy to teach you <laughs> yoga, but I still feel a little bit afraid of your tone. No, Peter. You shouldn't be afraid 
Oh. <laughs> wow. Well, that was certainly foreboding, MHS Ultra Seismic Megatroid 3033, but let's get to Kate. Enough of my co-host here. Kate, I am sincerely so happy that you're here on the show. All walks of life, let's inspire here on the Fireside app. Um, before we get started, I, I really want the audience to know a lot more mm -hmm. about the MFPA because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people either don't know about it or maybe have misconceptions about it. Yeah. But I know I've done a lot of talking so far, but would you mind if I indulge the audience in the quick story of how I decided to apply for the MFPA? <laughs> For sure, yeah. I think it's an important story. I think um, learning about how people found us and, and why they, they chose to become part of the association is, is a really um, important factor in, in what makes the math and foot painting artists so special, right? I totally agree. I totally agree. So I became friends over Facebook with Miriam Paré, mm -hmm. who is a quadriplegic at a very similar level to me. And she was curious about life in LA. We became friends. We started Skyping, trading quad stories. But I knew Mary, I got to know Miriam as a painter. And I knew she was an incredible painter. But I just thought that was kind of her gig in life, that she was a painter. Mm -hmm. And then one day we were having a Skype and I was like, so how did you get into painting? And, you know, she told me how she used to paint, but that the big deal is that she's a member of the MFPA, the Mouth and Feet Painting Artists. And I was like, oh, what's that? And, you know, she told me that, you know, they're based in Switzerland and they have an office here in America and that she's been a member for all these years and how amazing it is. And she's like, you're a real creative guy, Peter. Have you ever thought about painting? I was like, you know, I've I've got an artistic flair, sure, I'm creative, sure. I've never painted properly outside of a couple of projects in a class in high school. But as a director, when I drew my storyboards, I actually held the pencil in my teeth and I would, you know, draw storyboards with a pencil. And my DPs, director of photography, has always loved my storyboards and thought that they had a certain charm to them. So anyway, I was like, she was like, yeah, you know, so there's an application process. It's actually coming up in August. It was like a month away. And she's like, you know, you have to fill out some questions and write some essays and, you know, give them six examples of painting. And it really helps to show that you had an interest in art before you were injured. I was like, well, you know, I've got two teachers from high school that I'm still so that I'm still friends with and stuff. And I'm sure that one of them would vouch for me of my interest in art before this. And I'm like, you know, I'll think about it, but you know, I don't know. So I was really on the fence when we got done with that Skype call. About two hours later, that same day, a knock came on my door and it was a uh, UPS and they gave me a round poster package. And I opened it up. And it was some of my artwork from high school from one of the teachers I mentioned on my Skype to Miriam. And he had a note saying that he was retiring and that he had my art on his wall in his office all these years. And instead of throwing it away, he thought he would ship it to me. And I was like, wow, if that's not the universe telling me that I need to apply for the MFPA, then I don't know what is. And so I did some paintings and put together a presentation and applied to MFPA and I got in and here I am today. You know, you've never, I've never, you've never told me that story. That's, that's amazing. Oh, wow. um, yeah. I mean, I know that you and I met just, uh, just before you applied, we met in LA when I was out with Mariam doing some work. Um, and so like, I, you know, I met you that way. Um, and, uh, and then you applied shortly thereafter, but I had no idea about like the kismet of, of, <laughs> How you how you finally made the decision to join? Thank you so much for sharing that. That's that's really cool. Yeah, and I'm so I'm so glad that you got to hear it. I just assumed you knew that story for some reason. No, no, no I didn't. So that was lovely. And it should bring up talking about 
our both mutual dear friend, Miriam Paré, actually Deanna in our audience here has an incredible show herself, Laughter After Trauma, which I've appeared on. And her guest on November 1st is none other than Miriam Paré. So that would be a wonderful show to tune into. Yeah, for sure. I'll definitely... I'll definitely tune into that. Um, I can listen and hear Mariam speak on pretty much any topic anyway. So um, it, that would be um, a really beautiful and interesting um, interview, I'm sure. Totally. So now after all of my yakking, Kate, <laughs> give us kind of like an over-encompassing nutshell of the MFPA for the, you know, and give it for the person that has no idea what it is. Yeah, so um, the Mouth and Foot Painting Artists is a worldwide association of adaptive artists who, through injury, illness, accident, or congenital disorder, are unable to use their, their hands. Um, and so they paint holding um, the brush between the teeth um, or the toes. Um, and then those originals are then turned into high quality reproductions that were then, you know, marketed to the general public as, you know, value added goods. You know, we sell cards, calendars, puzzles. Um, and so all the, all the reproductions you see are from originals painted by a mouth or foot painter. And then it's through the sale of those products that the artists earn an independent living. So we're a for-profit. And I think that's a really important distinction that, that people need to know is that this is a way for adaptive artists to find independence financially through their work. Um, you know, October is, is National Disability Employment Month. Um, you know, that's when we send out um, packages in the mail, um, you know, kind of coincidentally. Um, but it's, it's the time of year we send out holiday package for people to put, pe um, for customers to purchase. Um, and so, you know, this, this idea of, of adaptive artists um, who, you know, they're on the board, you know, it's member artists from within the association who make up the board. And so they're making these decisions for adaptive artists by adaptive artists. Um, and I think that's really important that people don't really realize. I think they, they think it's, you know, they think it's a charity. And when this organization started in 1957 by um, a mouth painter by the name of Eric Stegman, he, he contracted polio when he was two years old and lost the use of his upper extremities. He abhorred the idea of being treated as a quote unquote charity case. Um, he felt that just because he had a different modality to paint, he should not be viewed any differently than, you know, able-bodied artists, his peers. Um, and I think that's what really sets us apart. Um, and, uh, and I think that's what makes the association so special. I love, too, that uh, to this day, the MFPA's motto is self-help, not charity. Mm-hmm. For sure, for sure. Um, and kind of the second motto to that is kind of the unofficial one is artist first, disabled second. Right? Mm, that's um, the first one and I think, I'm hearing. That. Yeah. So, I mean, you want to be viewed by your, the standard of your artwork, right? I mean, yes, the modality by which you paint does is important, but you want to be seen as a, as a working artist. You don't want to be seen as, oh, isn't that, isn't that lovely? Oh, isn't that nice that he does that? Isn't that, isn't that special and precious that he paints with his mouth? How wonderful. You want to be like, no, I'm, I'm an artist. Here is my work, right? Here is, here is the work that I have I've put poured blood, sweat, and tears into. Um, and this is what I have to offer. This is the value that I bring. Um, and I, I think that's really important. Um, and I don't think that's, that's oftentimes realized, maybe, um, be that, that little factor. Yeah, not to bring up Miriam again and again, but that's how I felt about Miriam in the beginning. I just thought she was this incredible artist, and she is. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that was the great thing about the MFPA with her is that I, it gave her the chance to live as an artist and an outsider stumbling across her is like, wow, here's an amazing painter. Yeah. But then you learn the depths of this amazing group that she's a part of. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I also love that, personally speaking, that the MFPA brought me aboard and accepted me as a member because 
you know, I have a very whimsical, absurd, kind of cartoony style to my painting, which, you know, actually in my application too, in one of my, in my essay, I kind of mentioned like, you know, if you're looking for still lifes or landscapes or, you know, portraits, like I'm not your guy, but if you want, you know, something absurd with a sense of humor, I'm your guy, you know? Yeah, but I think that's one of the beauties about it, right? Okay, so yeah, we are selling cards and calendars and puzzles. There's a certain, you know, genre of painting that does well from a reproduction standpoint. But we published your work in a children's book, you know? We did, we did Muffin's Fun and Curious Christmas. So whilst your work is not, um, you know, I don't want to say commercial because it is, you know, it is commercial, but, you know, it's not, you know, like a, a, a landscape or, a, you know, photorealistic still life. There, there was this amazing value in what you created for this particular product that we needed. There was a, there was a niche that you fit into. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's the, the, you know, kind of the great thing about the fact that, you know, this is a worldwide organization. Different, different countries have entirely different tastes. They're looking for entirely different things. What we're looking for to use in the, you know, what, what our customers want to see in the United States is not the same as, you know, one of the customers in, in Italy or Japan or South Africa. So even though you don't fall into this kind of like, I hate to say it, like kind of this Thomas Kincaid-esque mode, um, there's still, you know, Thomas Kincaid, painter of light, registered trademark, um, there's still a need and a, and a demand for your work, just like there is a need and a demand for the works of, of you know, many of the artists who apply to the association. You know, there's a, yeah, we, it's not prescriptive and it shouldn't be prescriptive. Yeah, and really what I was getting at is the fact that you open your arms to all different types of painters too. Mm -hmm. so I was, that's why I was like pleased as punch that I got brought into the family for sure. And an interesting thing you just brought up too about all the, I'm still like amazed when I see all the different countries that have MFPA offices. Mm -hmm. What is it like about 14 different countries or something? Oh, no. Um, so we have artists representing 70 different countries around the world. Um, you know, we have 800 artists worldwide, which is insane. It's, wow. just, it's, it's fantastic. You know, what started off as this little kind of cottage industry of seven people, seven painters, has now grown into this, this worldwide cooperative of, of adaptive artists. Um, and that's, that's, I think that's a real testament to, to, to the strength of, of the association. Absolutely. How many artists worldwide would you say are in the MFPA? Do you have an idea? Yeah, so there's 800 artists worldwide. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. That yeah, is a lot yeah. of with a lot of diverse styles and cultures. Yeah, incredibly, incredibly diverse, incredibly diverse styles, incredibly diverse cultures, incredibly diverse subject matters. Now, you know, like I said, um, there's the association as a whole, and then there's the the kind of the side that I'm in, which is more of like a, a for want of a better word, publishing side. You know, we we create the cards and the calendars that are sent out. So, you know, <clears throat> we're not going to probably put a nude on one of our calendars, um, especially not here in the United States. <laughs> I don't think that would go over well. But um, when the artists send in their artwork for evaluation and when, when artists from the United States talk to me about, you know, hey, um, <clears throat> I've done this piece. Um, I don't think you can maybe use it, um, but should I send it in anyway? And I'm like, hell yeah, you should send it in because when you're come, when the when the, the the jury, which is as you know, a jury of your peers, um, look at your artworks over the you know the expanse of time that you're sending them in, they're going to get a better idea of of how you're progressing as an artist, not by you creating these cookie cutter like <clears throat> excuse me, this is a this is a snowman, this is a this is a landscape, this is a boat. They want to see what inspires you because that's going to be the work you put the most time and effort into. That's going to be where your passion really. Is, is visible. Um, and so um, that's how they're going to get a better idea, really, of, of, of how you're moving forward as an artist. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. On one hand, it's amazing. On the other hand, I'm kind of bummed out because my latest painting, Nude Santa, peers over Lake Piper. 
probably <laughs> isn't going to have a chance to be on a Christmas card. Um, I'm, I'm, I love you, Peter, but I'm going to say no. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, I think if I present that as an option for, uh, for a card choice for Christmas 2023, it's going to get shut down pretty fast. <laughs> But in the spirit of what you were just talking about, mm -hmm. I did do a, I can't, it's not a triptych when you have four paintings. I did these four paintings that were an homage to Kill Bill, mm -hmm. which yeah, includes like, you know, a severed foot, a, an eyeball, you know, a sword dripping in blood and a couple other things. And, you know, I sent them in just as like, cause that was something that kind of interested me as an artist to do and, I knew that it wasn't going to be in the next calendar, but in the spirit of what you have always told me from day one, you know, we want to see things that interest you as well and see your growth as an artist and your perspective as an artist. And I think that's awesome. For sure. And yeah. not, to, not to harp on me even more, but oh, I do want to let you know <laughs> that if you are watching right now live, Welcome to the show, Stephanie, and thank you again for being here, Deanna and Frederick and Graciela. Um, you can go to the fortune cookie, and there is the link for MFPAUSA.com and also Kate's personal Instagram. We're going to get more into Kate's story coming up here on All Walks of Life on Fireside. But you can find her on Instagram at Sacred Seam Yoga. S E A M, and I can't wait to hear more about the meaning of that. But also, if you go to www.mfpausa.com, that's where you could find all these amazing products Kate spoke of, including my book, Muffins Fun and Curious Christmas. And uh, it's always a big hit around the holidays. And I think it's okay to let people know that probably about this time next year, if everything gets turned in by me on time, mm. uh, the, uh, <laughs> we will have a follow-up coming out called Muffin and Mac Travel the World with Muffin's new sidekick companion, Mac the Duck, which I'm working on heartily right now. Yeah, I'm excited for that. I'm really jazzed about that one. I think it's going to be great. So yes, whether you're watching now or watching the replay, check out the fortune cookie, learn about Kate at her Instagram or go to mfpausa.com to see more about myself, other artists, and where you can sign up for MFPA mailing lists. And you could actually purchase like the stuff that Kate was talking about earlier. So Kate, hmm. before the show, I asked you, about some things that interest you in life. Mm -hmm. And that means it's time for a segment on this show. If you would be so kind to announce it, MHS Ultra Seismic Megatroid 3033. And now you know. Yes, it's time for the And Now You Know segment here on All Walks of Life. So, Kate, mm. to start with, since we've been talking about the MFPA, which deals with disability in art, I'm wondering if you knew, I'm wondering if the audience knows, the first depiction of disability in art, as documented by mankind, is thought to be from 1325, an artist named Luttrell Salter, with a P, turned out two paintings, one called Man with Crutches and the other Crippled Child. And one literally depicted a man using crutches and the crippled child was a crippled child on a cart pulled by two other people. Did you know that, Kate? I did not know that. So there is something I have learned today. Thank you very much. And this was that you said it was 1320 and something, some change. 13, 1325. Okay. And in that oh. vein, the first 
documented, quote unquote, disabled artists to the best of MHS Ultra Seismic Megatroid 3033's knowledge and research was Toulouse Le Trek from France mm -hmm. back in the mid to late 19th century. Mm -hmm. And he broke both of his legs right about the time he turned 12. And he suffered from a condition called psychodiasosis. And so when he grew up, his legs were extremely short and he had to walk with uh, crutches and braces. But he's a world renowned artist. Now, that one I did know. Um, I actually really enjoy the work of Talisa Track. So. Amazing. So, Kate mm. and my fireside audience. Did you know? One thing that you're into right now is motherhood. <laughs> yeah, you know? I, I guess you could say I'm into it. <laughs> I'm kind of, I don't really Did have a choice, but yeah. know that something that is instrumental for every mother is the little rubber baby nipple that you give your baby. Mm. And that n rubber nipple was invented in 1845 by Elijah Pratt in New York. However, it took until the 20th century in the 1900s for the technology to improve sufficiently that the rubber would be softer, more practical, and also be able to be heated to a degree to be sterilized. But it was invented in 1845 by Elijah Pratt. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I did not know that. Well, and now you know. One final thing, Kate mm -hmm. and my mm -hmm. audience here at Fireside or any podcast platform you might be listening to the show on, another thing that you are into that we're going to learn more about is yoga. Yes. Did you know that the practice of yoga is believed to have started with the very dawn of civilization. The science of yoga has its origins thousands of years ago, long before first religions, before belief systems were born. In the yogic lore, Shiva is seen as the first yogi or Adi yogi and the first guru or Adi guru. Did you know? Yeah. Now, I did know that. Um, so yeah, the, the yoga that we understand today, kind of Hatha yoga and, and all its, its, you know, offshoots, um, and, and the, the philosophy of yoga wasn't really codified until around about one, um, like zero BCE. Um, so, but it existed long, um, long before that it's discussed in the, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, um, and, uh, and, um, yeah, so I did know that one. That one I did know. I'm glad I knew that one. I should know that one as a, <laughs> as a yoga teacher. <laughs> and that's amazing. You were hip to two of the three. Yeah. So I think um, that's a pretty, a pretty, that's actually the best score yet. And so Kate, <laughs> my fireside audience and anyone listening to the replay or the podcast, did you know these things? Maybe you did, but if you didn't, and now you know. And there you go. That was the And Now You Know segment here on All Walks of Life exclusively on Fireside. You are listening or watching All Walks of Life. Let's inspire here on Fireside. I'm your host, Peter Sobey. My guest is Kate Adams, the artist liaison for MFPA North America. Now we've talked about the MFPA and about their history and what they're about. And now tell me about your journey that led you to being involved in the MFPA. Yeah, so I mean, I, 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 the Mouth and Foot Painting Artist has been in my sphere for the last 
well, almost 36 year, uh, 38 years. Um, so my my father actually um, he he is the um, the director of, of MFPA North America, um, and he used to work um, when we lived back home in England uh, for a printing company. He was the um, the chief, uh, he was the executive officer of a printing company. Um, uh, sorry, the financial officer of a printing company. I beg your pardon. Um, and it just so happened that that particular printing company printed all the cards and calendars for a certain group of artists um, in Europe. NFPA, if you didn't kind of cut on to that one. Um, and so um, that's what my dad was doing at the time. And then he was asked um, to, if he wanted to, to come over to the States and take over the North American kind of publishing side of things. And my dad is a very smart man. And so he said, yes. And so that brought us over here about 22 years ago. Um, and then, you know, I've, I've, you know, during when I was at university, I would work during the, you know, very seasonal in what we do. So I would work during our busy seasons um, and just kind of I was picking up a lot of stuff by osmosis. Um, and then I moved to, um, to Toronto for a few years to do some um, postgraduate work. Um, and I worked in the office because we have an office up in Toronto. And then I came back to the States um, and again, I was just temping. Um, and then this, this kind of opportunity presented itself to me to, to kind of move into this role that I now found myself in. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I kind of jumped at the opportunity. Um, it was something I knew. It was something I was familiar with. It was something I believed in. Um, and so here we are. So that was about 10, 11 years ago, almost. Um, and I've kind of you know, my position has changed a lot as I've, as I've moved, you know, moved through. Um, but the core of it has always been that I'm, I act as a conduit between, you know, the North American artists and our head offices overseas. Um, and I, I, I work for the artists to, to make sure that, you know, paperwork is turned in and their artwork is turned in. And then I also work in the commercial side of things and, in, 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 you know, picking the artwork to be used in our calendars and, and what have you. Um, and so that's really, it's, it's, it's not like some of this like great aspirational or inspirational story. It was just kind of the right place at the right time. Um, and, and, you know, really kind of, you know, you said at the beginning about um, how the universe kind of presents itself to you and it's our job to listen, right? Because a lot the, the universe is constantly giving us gifts and we're so kind of single-minded and single-focused on what we think we want or what we think the path is for us or what we think we should be that we miss all these signals like flying at us constantly. And if you just take a moment to just kind of shut out the chatter and actually listen, um, then you can receive those signals. And, and I think it was just that, just that opportunity. It was like, you know, came, to my, came my way. And rather than saying, no, I'm not doing that because that's not what I thought I was going to do or thought I was what I was going to be, um, I said, okay, let's see, let's see what happens with this. And then here I am um, on a Saturday evening, um, you know, sat in my cozy sweater. I wore this sweater, by the way, because I thought it was apropos for a fireside chat. It's my fuzziest one. And here I sit, um, you know, with you um, having a chat about, you know, this amazing organization. So, you know, universe has plans. We just have to listen. Yes, MHS Ultra Seismic Multiplayer 3033. That is a lot of inspiration. And Kate, I love that sweater. I was going to mention that actually. I'm glad you brought it up. I love yeah. the like the thunder or the lightning bolts. Or My the lightning spark. bolts. So yeah. cool. Yeah. So cool. My daughter likes it too because it's like it's textured and she likes she can it's fuzzy. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I it's funny because even though you started by saying, uh, oh, you know, so it's not really that whatever the story, but then you totally laid down the wisdom and the inspiration. You're right. Listening to the universe, we sometimes get so set in our ways or what we think is the path that we miss mm -hmm. the messages. And when we actually listen to it, it's almost like we have an obligation to the universe to act upon it. And I'm yeah. so glad you did and that it led to you sitting here right now. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I kind of just to tie everything in with yoga because everything comes back to yoga for me. Yes. Um, in, the, in the sutras of Patanjali, um, the second sutra is yogaha chitta vritti narodaha. 
And that translates to yoga is the mastery of the fluctuations of the mind. Um, and, and what that is, is it's, you know, the practice of sitting still, the practice of being focused, the practice of moving inwards is in an effort to calm all this noise so that we can become kind of a clean vessel for, you know, whatever our idea of the divine is, you know, and some may call that God, some may call that the universe, some may call that divine inspiration. But, you know, that idea of just like turning off the noise for just a second and actually listening, not just hearing, but listening. Um, and you'd be amazed by what, what comes your way. Wow. I actually feel like you've kind of transcended me just listening to you for that minute. Cause actually like I do need to like focus my skills on listening just to do this show. But secondly, what I've learned from watching, rewatching a couple of my first six episodes, this is my seventh, is that it's easy for me to have a tendency to want to look at myself and look at my guests on the screen because I feel like I'm engaging with them that way. But when I rewatched the show, I couldn't help but notice that that makes my eyes look down and I'm not engaged with the audience watching the show whatsoever. So I have to train myself to stare at the camera. So right now it looks like I'm looking right at you, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas like usually I would be looking down at you like this, but then it doesn't look like I'm engaged mm -hmm. with the audience. But on the flip side, by having to look up at the camera and not stare right at you, I'm able to listen even keener. So I swear when mm -hmm. you were just talking about that and quieting your mind, you almost like did a meditation for me. It was unbelievable. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, you know, you actually brought up a really interesting point there. Um, and I think, I think this kind of channels back to, everything's cyclical, right? We're just going to run back to, to where we started in regards to why MFPA is so special. Everyone wants to be seen. That's all we want, right? Is to be seen and to be heard. And we want to be truly seen and truly heard. Um, and we do that. We do that, that you know, we, we find that listening. We find that seeing through deep, true, honest connection with one another. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's hard right now. There's, a, there's this barrier in between us, which is the, the, the camera lens. Um, but that's all, of, all any of us want, right? Is to find mm -hmm. that deep connection um, and to feel like my place in the world is worthy because I am worthy. You know, my existence predicates my enoughness. Um, and, and to, to, to feel like what we have is, you know, we have authority to have a voice that what we say matters, that our life matters. Um, and so that action of just saying, okay, well, I need to look directly into the camera so that my audience can see me versus me looking down to connect with, you know, my guest or, and let's admit we all do it kind of quickly glance at my, yourself and be like, do I have a booger in my nose? Um, which I hope to God I don't. Um, <laughs> but, you know, instead you're looking directly at the camera um, in an effort to find that abiding connection, even with this obstacle in the way. And I think, so I think that's really amazing that you're doing that. I think that's really cool. And, you know, listening to you talk, just to give props to the fireside audience here, I feel like I could be listening to Diana or Graciela, who are both live in the audience right now. Graciela's show here on Fireside is 7 p.m. PST Monday nights, and Diana's show is 6 p.m. PST Tuesday nights. And they talk about things like this all the time. But I'm so grateful that you're here and that we can so easily go from mouth painting to you know, these really deep and inspiring thoughts. And uh, I just appreciate your willingness to share, Kate, because 
you know, you're giving me goosebumps of inspiration. I love it. And I think that um, I'd kind of like to pull that into your yoga life right now mm -hmm. on your Instagram, which is right there in the uh, fortune cookie, Sacred Seam Yoga. But it's S-E-A-M, and your profile picture is like a broken plate. And your mm -hmm. motto under your profile says, helping you learn to see the beauty in broken places. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. think that alone is amazing, but tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, I actually, my, my mom is part of this as well. She's a, she's a Reiki master. And so, um, you know, yoga and Reiki is, is all about healing, right? Um, it's about, you know, yoga, it's about healing that, that false idea that we have separation. It's about finding congruency, understanding that we are divine beings living a human existence and finding that, that, that balance point between the two. And, and Reiki is about balancing out the, the chakras, the energy systems, the energy meridians within the body. But it's always about healing. Um, and this inspiration for the name actually comes from the, um, the Japanese both art form and philosophy of Kintsugi. Um, and if you're not familiar with what Kintsugi is, so the art of Kintsugi is um, if you say you have a pot, a teapot or a vase, and it breaks. Now, in kind of normal kind of, you know, understanding of a broken object is something, it suddenly no longer becomes useful. It's lost its utilitarian purpose. So we throw it away most of the time. Um, or if we do mend it, we try and mend it in such a way that you can never tell it's broken. Kintsugi takes that broken object, seam, and, and on the seam where the break is, it paints it, it seals it with lacquered gold. So you can, the, the cracks and the breaks become a, a beautification and also represent the life of the object. We all have scars, right? Um, uh, Patanjali um, says, you know, always says in his sutra says, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. We all experience pain. We all experience trauma. That is the human existence. But rather than trying to mend ourselves or, you know, this is one of my favorite ones, like, I'm going to live my best life. I'm like, you're already living it, right? You just haven't attended to it. Um, or or to, to reinvent ourselves or to, to push down the pain, push down our experiences and not let the world see this, this crack in our armor. But it is the breaks. It is the scars. It is those those darker parts of our lives that give us authenticity, um, that give us the right to take up space in this world. Um, and that's really what I do as a yoga teacher, is, is my primary job as a yoga teacher is to hold space for my students, to avoid projecting anything really of, of kind of my perceptions of the world into the class. Now I do make a pretty rocking playlist. I'm not going to lie, but you know, like my, my, my purpose there is to, is to hold space. And, and so that my students feel safe. They feel that they can move in the way they want to move. They can, they can breathe, they can connect. And then at the end of the practice, when they're in Shavasana, all that stuff can kind of settle and maybe they can move in the world a little freer. Like that's the hope, that's the dream. But it all comes from that idea of holding space for whomever comes into my class, knowing full well that they too have scars and those scars make them shine. Wow, okay. First of all, I'm mesmerized. I feel like you're speaking to my soul, like you're holding space for me right now. I'm waiting for your own show on Fireside now. <laughs> <laughs> listen to you talk about those things for hours at a time it's so amazing Deanna in the audience says she loves this concept she also wanted to share one of her favorite quotes my existence predicates my enoughness mm -hmm. which I thought is such a wonderful quote thanks for sharing Deanna but yeah Kate I am I'm completely 
completely mesmerized. And as we enter the final stretch of the show here, not a lot of time left, but there is a big question that I always like to ask on the show. We've talked about the MFPA. We've got in just, you know, kind of the tip of the iceberg of yoga. Mm -hmm. And I do want to acknowledge motherhood. But first, can you kind of share with us in the spirit of even more inspiration, like you haven't inspired us enough, what was like one of your greatest obstacles in life and how did yeah. you overcome it? Um, well, you know, I've, I've experienced darkness. Um, true, like really, I've, I've been in a very, very dark place. I have had mental, you know, that I feel like, you know, everyone has some kind of mental health trauma that they're trying to overcome. Um, and I made some, I'm not gonna lie, some pretty terrible decisions. Um, and um, I was fortunate enough to have a really great support network around me. Um, and mainly my mom and dad who um, I'm going to, I'm forever grateful for their support. Um, and if it hadn't been for them, I don't know whether I would have made it through if I'm honest. Um, and, and so just really the biggest obstacle was getting out of my own effing way. Right. Is, is, my biggest obstacle had always been this idea that I was preeminent, um, that I was either the hottest shit in the room or the worst piece of shit in the room. But either way, I was completely separated. It was all ego driven. Um, you know, in, in, in recovery programs, they call this idea terminal uniqueness because it will kill you. <laughs> this idea that you're somehow magically different. You're this special snowflake. Um, and all other rules in society don't apply to you. Like you've had the most trauma, you're the biggest victim. And it's all this like, I, me, 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 me. So really that was the biggest obstacle I had to overcome. Um, and it wasn't until I was completely broken down, like completely broken down, um, when I had nothing left, I had nowhere else to dig. You know, I'd hit bottom pretty significantly um, that I was able to kind of, rise up from that place um so me i'm the biggest obstacle i'm i've always been my biggest obstacle um it's just it's yeah just not not being able to get out of my own way and and like i said before and not seeing people and allowing others to see me i'm going to take back my answer you know what my biggest obstacle is and i think this is the same for everyone and it wasn't until i met my husband and i had a daughter that i truly understood what this what it meant to be vulnerable vulnerability being truly vulnerable with myself and other pe people people that has always been the hardest thing for me and it all goes back to the i self this kind of ego of having to uh, perpetuate this idea of what i thought i needed to be or what i thought i should be um but to be really true like to just really be flayed open and just being like here i am in my rawest state um and taking that leap um that, that was one of the hardest things I've, I've ever done um, to say, I have, I know nothing and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to just open myself up to, to people, places, things, the universe. If that, any of that made any sense. <laughs> it makes absolute sense. For certain. A quick follow-up to that is what advice would you have for someone that's in a dark place and is trying to find any little crevice to secure their foothold to move out of that dark place? You know, it's really hard. You don't want it because like what I don't, so this is, I'm getting, I don't, do people cry in your show? Cause like, I feel like you're Oprah right now. Cause I'm getting really teared up. I, I think I, I don't want to speak in platitudes, right? I don't want to give this whole, it gets better or, you know, reach out for help. Cause when you're in it, it's so hard to see anything other than the darkness right? But it's just that idea of, of just, just holding on, like holding on to hope, you know, holding on to those moments that those little things, you know, especially when you're kind of in the early days of, of kind of moving forward in, in your healing or your recovery, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not supposed to happen overnight, you know? 
you're dealing with years and years of holding patterns of fixed trauma within the body and the mind. Um, so trust, I guess this is what I would say, trust the process, just trust the process. And no, you may take two steps forward and one step back, but you're still further ahead than you were before. Um, and don't look at it as this, this mountain that you have to climb. All you have to do is just step over this small pebble in front of you and then the next and then the next and then those aggregate of steps build up and then you look back on your life of where you've come from, you know, however long it's been and even though it doesn't look like it at face value to you in the moment, when you look back and you see how far you've come, like that's a really amazing thing but you have to hold on and trust the process. You have to exercise a little bit of patience. So that's what I would say. And you agree with that tapas. I think that's incredible advice, you know, and uh, just to throw in my own two cents and to circle back to the very beginning of the show, I felt like when I was in my dark place of, you know, laying in a hospital bed with a broken neck and not knowing what was going on or what my future was, you know, that's what kept me going was always look forward and, you know, then when I progressed in my rehabilitation, you know, even when they sat me up in a wheelchair for the first time, it was a power wheelchair. I could barely move my right arm and just somewhat move my left arm. And I begged them to let me use a manual wheelchair. And they literally laughed at me saying like, no, you're probably going to need a sip and puff power chair. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, please just let me sit in a manual wheelchair I, I think it took several weeks. They kept putting me in a power chair. And then finally, someone, you know, finally listened to me and they put me in a manual chair that had these little nubs on the rims. So you could literally kind of use your wrists to push. Mm -hmm. And my right arm couldn't push at all. But my left arm pushed a couple inches. And they're like, see, you're just going to push in circles. You can't even use your right arm. I was like, I was like, I didn't see it that way at all. I just pushed two inches. Didn't you just see me push those two inches? And I think tomorrow I'm going to push four inches, and then my right arm's eventually going to catch up. This is great. I love it. And mm -hmm. that that's kind of, to me, spoke to when you said, like, you know, you just got to step over one little pebble at a time. And if you could somehow distill a dark situation to one push at a time, one small step at a time, one small pebble at a time, you'll be amazed at the progress you make. Yeah. yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, it's hard, though. It's really hard to do that because we want to get so many, you know, we, we live in a world where we want things now. I mean, like, I literally, before we got on this, I said, David, I want Indian food for dinner. Mm -hmm. And he went on Uber Eats and he, you know, probably sitting outside right now it's like instantaneous like we, we like we want something and it's right there in front of us so mm -hmm. having to learn to trust that process you know having a having a baby having my child is is a really good you know re-remembering like relearning of, of why that's so important um unfortunately my daughter is very much like me um in her personality <laughs> so I don't know. oh we're in for a treat um but like i and see her desperately She's adorable, yeah. She is adorable. She is adorable. I think she's quite, I think she's my favorite person. Um, but I see her things. desperately trying, <laughs> she's desperately trying to crawl. I'm like, little girl, we are still working on sitting you up. I, and she's getting so frustrated and her little legs are going and her little arms are going and she's like swimming on the floor and she's trying to crawl herself forward. And I'm like, let's just work on like you're rolling like crazy that's such a good step like just that we're working on sitting just wait little one you're not ready you're not ready but one day you will be um and it's just such a good reminder that we can't jump ahead until we've fixed what's right here in the present right yeah and on that note i think it's a great way to end the show. I can't believe that an hour has gone by. We never even got into whistles of wondering or wheels of wisdom, but that's okay because what we got instead was some great deep 
connected conversation and inspiration. And I'm so grateful to you, Kate, for not only being on the show, but for being real, for being vulnerable, for sharing with me like that, for inspiring the audience. So thank you so much, Kate Adams from the MFPA North America for being here on All Walks of Life. Thanks so much, Peter. It was so great to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. This has been such a joy. And I do want to remind people that if you're watching a replay or listening on a podcast, that you can find Kate on Instagram at Sacred Seam Yoga, S E A M Yoga. And you can go to www.mfpausa.com to find all the great American mouth and feet painters like myself and learn more about us and buy the products. And um, once again, thank you for being on the show, Kate. And just to let you all know, here on All Walks of Life, Let's Inspire. There we go. We've got a couple of great shows coming up. Tuesday, October 11th, in just three days, my guest is renowned vegan chef, Chef AJ. Next Saturday, October 15th, my guest is the acclaimed actress, Michelle Kruziak who actually just made her directing debut with a short called Neon, which is part of Bite Size Halloween on Hulu. So stay tuned for those shows. And thank you for watching and listening 